wow, that is really cool. So I coach soccer at the high school, and I wish if I stood up in front of those girls, they would do that when they come up. That is amazing. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Aaron Kubik. I have the privilege of being the city manager for Grants Pass, and, and we'd like to welcome you today uh, to our the 2018 Grants Pass State of the City Address. So we've got some refreshments over here to the side of the room. Uh, behind you are the restrooms. And if I could ask any of you to have your cell phones, if you could turn them on um, quiet, on uh, vibrate mode or something along those lines so it doesn't interrupt the report that we're about to give. I want to recognize uh, first by starting off recognizing the elected officials here in the room. Uh, we've got Council President Valerie Loveless. Mm -hmm. Valerie. And... Councilor Barry Eames, thank you. <laughs> Councilor Roy Lindsay. <laughs> Councilor Jason Sharp. <laughs> Councilor Roller. <laughs> Councilors, thank you very much for attending this evening. I'd also like to thank the advisory committee and commission members that are here today. Uh, you have all been partners in everything we do, including the city's dedicated staff, and most importantly, the residents of this great city. Today, we are releasing our annual State of the City report. This will paint a picture of what our mayor, council, and community cares about the most. Today, you will hear from Mayor Darren Fowler. Mayor Fowler will highlight the City of Grants Pass's priorities, focusing on creating a safe environment, providing cooperative leadership, encouraging economic opportunities, facilitating sustainable, manageable growth, maintaining, operating, and expanding our infrastructure to meet our community needs. You know, we've heard a lot about necessary budget cuts, deficiencies, partisan politics at the state and national level. Local leadership, that of which Grants Pass City Council consistently demonstrates has never been so important. Our City Council, along with many other cities throughout the nation, are the most trusted level of government. We are responsive to our constituents and operate an efficient and effective organization within budget. Here in Grants Pass, we recognize and find solutions to our most pressing challenges. What you'll hear today is a good dose of realism regarding the challenges facing the city and how we as a community will solve those challenges and through these efforts become stronger and add value to our great quality of life. The City of Grants Pass is a driver of innovation, accountability, and leadership. The Mayor and Council are directly confronting and are motivated by all that is great and all that must be improved in our community. The mayor and council have fostered an intimate relationship with this community. Our city's future will be set by those coming together, building community, and creating opportunity. And with that, it is my great pleasure to now introduce Mayor Fowler. Thank you, Aaron. And thank you all for taking some time out of your schedule to come and hear what's going on in our city. So let me welcome you to our first ever community-wide state of the city. We are so fortunate to live in such a wonderful place on this planet. We have our share of problems, but that won't stop us from moving forward, seizing opportunities for business and families to be successful and happy, and dealing with the realities of running a city this size. Our stated goals are on the board over there at the bottom. And that's what I'm going to use for my uh, structure to give you this information uh, and explain the state of our city. So goal number one, keeping citizens safe. That is really the principal job of government. And as you know, we have some challenges in our town, keeping our citizens safe. But we've also taken some steps to change some of the atmosphere in downtown. We worked hard with... Uh, St. Vincent de Paul to change their business model to where they're no longer serving out of the building that they cook in, but they have a mobile kitchen that the city helped them get. 
and now ha goes to different locations where I think they're really helping more of the people they desired to help and not just handing food out of a window. Um, our rogue area drug enforcement team have taken over the supervising and uh, ha have had their most productive year ever with meth and heroin seizures uh, and reductions in property crimes. The Sobering Center, which the city partnered with a lot of the community uh, businesses and members, continues to serve our community well and provides a service outside of the criminal justice system, saving dollars and time. And of course, our nuisance intervention team, or NIT, that our police chief came up with, has been addressing the vagrancy issue head on by uh, walking the alleys and driving the alleys and getting downtown ready for business every day. Um, we also helped get school marshals into our schools to protect our children, which now is kind of a, a national, uh, at a high point as far as awareness right now. And I'm glad we were ahead of the curve on that one. Um, but of course we face challenges as well with future criminal justice funding, with countywide criminal justice funding. Everybody feels like it's fully funded, but it is not. We still have uh, limited patrols. The city is still having to do uh, all the detective work outside of the city. So we're spending resources that we shouldn't have to as a city uh, to keep our whole community safe. Um, and of course, jail space is always an issue and protecting our schools, as I mentioned before. To do this, the council and uh, our staff have purchased the... Uh, old DHS building over there for a new police station. Uh, many of you know we've shared the county building for years and paid rent over there, but that building's no longer, uh, or probably never was, seismically safe. And so we've had limited access and limited uh, maintenance and office space over there. It's going to be great to have our own building, um, which is in such uh, close proximity as well. So there we're retrofitting that building and that'll house our city's public safety and the 911 agency. And because of the efforts of our police and council, since 2012, crime has decreased each year. Last year, burglaries were half of what they were in 2012, down from over 600 down into the 300s. And crime reduction in the city during the first six months of 2017 as compared to the same year previous, 16, we have a 56% reduction in burglaries, 39% in thefts and motor vehicles, and 38% reduction in thefts overall. So what we're doing is working. It's just that the problem never goes all the way away. And so we still have to stay on it. Um, the nuisance intervention team that I mentioned has been taking on those vagrancy issues. And the downtown merchants now have an ability to come to our uh, quarterly meetings and sometimes more often just to give their input. And that trust has really been built up between the police and the downtown businesses. We're responding. We had an opportunity to privatize uh, parking tickets that would have been less expensive and a little more efficient and our code officers could go on to other problems. But the downtown, downtown said, no, we love having the CSOs coming by, having a relationship with them, being able to talk to them. We don't want some car driving by, taking pictures and giving tickets. That's not who we are. So uh, those kind of things have really helped us keep downtown uh, functioning at a high level and ready for our tourists and our citizens to go and purchase things down there. Um, the Fire and Rescue Department, they've increased inspections for fire safety and enhance their fire prevention unit. And they've also worked on uh, getting more accreditation to uh, standardize their delivery of service. And they've increased their presence around town at special events and uh, get really getting into the community. But because we have a lack of mutual aid partners, when the fire happens in Medford, they've got all these cities around them that can come help. And we don't have that here. We have uh, Rural Metro and a couple other private agencies, but we, we don't have the same depth there. So we have to have a larger department to try and be ready for the problems we hope never happen. That's why the council has taken on the difficult subject of trying to form uh, a fire district, to offer it to a vote to the community and show them the advantages and the disadvantages of moving in that direction. But a lot of cities in Oregon have 
moved that direction already and uh, are privatizing fire, getting out of the fire business, so to speak, to get away from a lot of the entanglements that municipalities have with having such uh, large departments. And so that's something we're gonna work on over the next year or two. Um, we also successfully passed our public safety levy after the county passed theirs. And so we had good, strong support. In fact, the, the county-wide one would not have passed were it not for the city voters. There was 58% uh, of the city voters voted yes, um, but only 47% of the county voters voted yes. So the city carried the whole county across the line. And again, that's, that's not fully funding public safety. That's only getting it off the bottom. We still have a ways to go to where we have a fully functioning criminal justice system where all the, all the different agencies are working at full capacity so that we can take care of the, the criminal aspect of our community, which you know, has only increased with some of the latest developments in state law and the marijuana issues. Um, the second goal is provide cooperative shared leadership involving council, staff, and community. We uh, have a really strong council that really refuses to push the hard problems aside. They're willing to take them head on. The staff is willing to take them head on. And so we're able to move forward in a way that gets things done. Uh, we have a, a budget that is hard to get your head around. Uh, I've been here for a long time, seven, nine years, and it, it is a tough one to try and understand a municipal budget. Uh, but we have great employees, a great finance department that makes it uh, understandable for us, and um, the city's general governmental services, the non-utility services, are on track to be debt-free inside of two years from now. And the city's property tax rate will go down by about 3% the next fiscal year, 19, and down another 3 after that because of financial decisions that the city has made. Um, in public works, they hired an assistant public works director to help the city focus on improving our transportation system, um, development and maintenance. This will uh, help us implement a new stormwater utility, which we are forced by our population to have now, we have to, we've, they asked us five or six years ago, we've been working towards it ever since, but we're very close now to adding that and you will all see that on your utility bill eventually because we need to take good care of our stormwater. The days of letting it run down 6th and 7th Street and run into the river are really over. Uh, Oregon and the rest of the nation has turned their eye to healthier communities and not not putting things into the rivers. And we have a lot, some private groups that help with that, the Steelheaders Association. But um, we as a city want to make sure we're doing the right thing. So we're not going kicking and screaming. We know that it's a good idea to take care of it because that river is so valuable to our tourists, to our families that live here. Um, it's really uh, one of the things we love about this community. So we want to keep it healthy. And that means we want Medford and Gold Hill and Rogue River and all the cities upstream from us to do the same. And if we have to be the first one or we have to push it, we will. Uh, because we're one of the last ones before you get into the wild and scenic and head to the coast. So we want to make sure all the, the water's clean that's coming down through that river. Um, but an uptick in the economy has seen the construction costs increase. Uh, when we go out for a sidewalk project five years ago, you'd have 10 guys bidding on it and you'd be able to choose something. And, and now we, we have trouble finding bidders. They're all busy. Concrete prices have gone up. Labor's gone up. And so we've seen that kind of change the projects that we choose and the scale of them to try and uh, accommodate that difference. Um, and, but Public Works has remained very nimble and responsive to the citizens' request on a property-by-property uh, property basis, but also attacking the huge things like Imagine the pipes in the northwest area of town, how old they are for water and for sewer uh, in places, you know, we're talking 80 years old. And that technology was abandoned a long time ago. And it runs through people's yards and there's all kinds of obstacles with our infrastructure. But we've decided not to kick that down. Or let's get it, identify it, get it into a plan. We'll deal with it at this time after we deal with this other one that made a little higher priority. And so um, we're really trying to 
a tackle all those problems at once, which is hard to get your brain around again. That's, that's why we uh, developed this. Karen and Aaron came up with this um, so that we can kind of look at the bigger things that are on our horizon and not try and just talk about them, but let's see what we're dealing with and which ones affect the other and, and how we could work on two at once and or six at once, like in this frame over here. Um, that's what we've been doing. And so in development uh, or community development, excuse me, um, there's a, the, a new GIS system, the geographical information system that has really helped our uh, development department become more efficient. They have a lot of uh, good information in different formats so that you could come in. You really should come in and play with it sometime. Uh, one of the simplest things we did was ask our street sweeper to give us a schedule. You know, can I, can I get so many people park cars on the street that live in those old neighborhoods like I do? You've always got a car on the street, sometimes two. And, and so it's nice to know when they're coming so the street looks nice and you don't have all the bump outs of, uh, of non-clean streets. Um, but we also started the Adopt a Street program where there's uh, been people from the community that are willing to, to look after their own neighborhoods so that we don't have to rely on government for everything. Remember the days when there was a problem and the community got together and they solved it and, and then they moved on? Well, nowadays, everybody goes, what's the government going to do? And that, that is not the attitude because then you get mad at the other side. Why is government so expensive? Well, you guys asked us to do all this stuff. Well, we don't want you to do that now. And so... Being uh, flexible and finding ways to deliver services that don't take a big pile of government workers and money to accomplish is always going to be better in the long run. Because if you got a guy from ODOT driving from Medford to mow the grass around our exits, how good a job is he going to do? What if it was a local landscape company that had a little sign in the corner and they said, he's proud to do that. You know, I, I cleaned that up. Instead of some government employee going, oh, I got to drive to Grants Pass today, you know, and get that old tractor off that trailer or whatever. And so part of ODOT's, in my mind, funding problems that they keep expressing is their own fault. They've grown into this behemoth and forgot about contracting out. And so now they've got all this equipment and personnel and they're like, well, now we need more money. And it's like, well, we don't have any more money. And so things like that, we're trying to solve at a local level and by example, get through those problems without spending a bunch of money. Um, the next goal is encourage economic opportunities. Um, we formed a Grants Pass Urban Renewal Agency in 2016. And if you remember when they started the Third Bridge Corridor 30 years ago, <laughs> quite a while ago, um, they formed a development agency around that where you collect the taxes separately. You don't increase the taxes. You just collect them separately in that uh, geographic area, and then you can spend it on projects in that area and help businesses uh, start up in a new place or redevelop an area. And so we've got one set up now that is already successful. Uh, we've already approaching a million dollars in that one in a year and a half, so that we're going to be able to help people like Dutch Bros with their big project downtown and Spalding Industrial Park and improve our parks and streets in those areas. Um, and so we're pretty excited about that one being successful already and, and kind of programmed for success over the next 20 years uh, that we'll be able to do all those things without any additional taxes on anyone. And so I'm um, very proud of that accomplishment. Um, but it also can address uh, a blighted condition, some things that you and I just drive by now and don't look at. Uh, you could mention things like the South Y or the old... Uh, hospital up at the north end and we don't see them as much but you know when a tourist or a friend comes to town they see them and some of the old neighborhoods have 80 90 year old houses that are sitting on big lots that haven't been taken care of and wouldn't it be nice to redevelop that into some multifamily housing um, to make it more affordable we hope or at least have an opportunity to find a place because finding a rental in grants pass is way more difficult than it should be when you compare Medford and Grants Pass, the discrepancy is, is hundreds and hundreds of dollars. It's like, wow, that much a difference. Um, and so we've, we've got a housing uh, task force that is working on ideas to try and incentivize builders and investors to change their one-string banjo from single-family dwelling into, hey, let's do business and resi mixed. Let's do 
multifamily. Let's do a couple duplexes. I don't, we don't need to have the 48 units popping up everywhere, and I don't think we, we would. But even the, uh, a couple of duplexes where there was a house before could really change. And I, I, those don't need to happen on the bare properties at the edge of town. Let's redevelop town where everybody doesn't have to get into a car to go somewhere where they could walk to downtown and just be blocks away instead of being a mile away and having to cross the river back and forth. Um, we also have identified and, and prioritized some of the projects in that development agency so that we have a list of things that we're going to attack. And like I said, Spalding Industrial Park is near the top. That's the great employment lands out there. We got a willing partner that wants to move out there. He's already got a building out there. And so we're really trying to make that corner because there's lack of water out there. There's lack of sewer out there. There's lack of roads out there. I mean, the first developer would have to improve all of that to make their business go. And that's too daunting. So we're going to have to help as a city to get around this hard corner. And I think we're going to make it. Um, we also did some things downtown by offering uh, facade renovation grants, by life and safety fire grants. We've got one at the Redwood Hotel that's almost complete. That thing's going to open up and be just this great business, a restaurant. And um, there's others you've seen. Downtown really has turned their own corner and has started building back up, and the storefronts are less empty than they used to be. And even some of them are filled with historic district signs now instead of just being an empty building. And so I, they, we like the way that's headed. But it is certainly a uh, very unique downtown with those old buildings that are so cool but are not safe in an earthquake, not safe in a fire, um, and, you know, just weren't built. They thought they were going to last mm, 20, 30 years or whatever, you know. Who cares? But now those buildings are, are so charming uh, you want to help them to rehabilitate those because we're one of those communities that survived the uh, Walmart generation. Uh, when you say, hey, let's go to Medford, it's like, well, what part of Medford do you want to go to? You want to go to the Costco part or should we go over here to the uh, Walmart side where the uh, Fred Meyer and everything's at the south end? Or No, are we going to go to the Sears area? Or, no, are we going to go downtown? No, no, it's not going to there. But they got some good food carts now and the college is down there. Well, okay, now what about out this area at Central Point? You're like, well, where is Medford? But when you say Grants Pass, we got this nice core, nice historic core. We got a little shopping district out there with Walmart and Fred Meyer. And then we've got some n other nodes where there's stuff going on. But we've, we've been able to hang on to that charm. And that really helps our tourism industry because people love to come to these towns and look at the old buildings and shop in those shops and eat in the restaurants. But, of course, the maintenance issues and all that are expensive. And so we are trying to incentivize those things to help those businesses be successful. Um, the next goal is fac facilitate sustainable manageable growth. That bleeds into the conversation of uh, single-family dwellings versus um, multifamily. But a couple years ago, we came up with a better idea of having accessory dwelling units where if your property can uh, accommodate an extra dwelling unit of a thousand square feet or less, you can have everything in there, kitchen, bathroom, couple bedrooms, like a uh, large house, but then it could be a granny flat or a rental or a, a, you know, a friend needs a place for six months or whatever. And so that's one way we've uh, tried to solve the, the problem quicker, saying, hey, this is available. And even some of the builders in town have caught on to that and are promoting it to their own customers, which raises our density and, and keeps us uh, all close to town. And so that's one of the things, if you haven't heard about those, please check into them because they are, they're very sellable. Uh, and we did have 50 new lots approved and developed in 2017. And a total of 163 new residential unit permits were issued. So there we're back onto a growth curve. Um, after spending a few years uh, undulating near the bottom, we finally take off again. And so we want to do it smart. We want to do it in a way that people still like. We don't want to do things that people don't want, but we want to make it available for a few different um, diversified ideas about what a property should look like. And so we're, we're hoping that's uh, going to happen with this housing committee that we have formed. Um, <coughs> excuse me.
with that housing um, advisory committee, they're going to conduct a housing needs analysis, and they're going to look at the fee structures to try and incentive, incentivize those properties, and then some zone changes, perhaps, if that would work as well. Um, the next goal is maintain, operate, and expand our infrastructure to meet the community's needs. Um, we've completed five master plans. We waited, what, seven years for the urban growth boundary to finally be nailed down. And then we could get to work on our master plans, which during that time, they were near the end of their life, and then they were really near the end of their life. And so doing all that is, is hard and tenacious work, and it's not cheap either. You've got to hire consultants at times because it's not in your daily skill set of your employees. And, and so we're, we're, we're getting there on our master plans, and we'll be able to um, have those in place so when people do come here, we'll have a plan. Okay, this is the kind of community we are. These are your... Uh, different choices of development you could do. And so um, those master plans were critical. And we got a couple left, and we'll finally have them all renewed. Um, but we're working on needed pipe replacement in a, a lot of areas. And they, like I said before, they really have uh, lived way beyond their expected life. And so that leads us to a couple bigger items that we're working on in our infrastructure, and that is our water restoration plant. That one, we're in the middle of, uh, I think, phase two of our um, upgrade of that. If you haven't been over to that neighborhood, it's a pretty cool construction site to see over off of Greenwood down there. I took my grandson over there, and I said, hey, this is our water restoration plant. He's all, uh-uh, Grandpa, that's a sewer plant. <laughs> okay, because my daughter lives near there, so she'd walked him by there before obviously give him a better name than I thought of. Um, but he's, he has been correcting me lately, so he's getting a lot smarter. Um, but that's an over $20 million project, and it's our first one that was a, uh, oh, what do you call it, Jason? The design, build. design build. Instead of just putting something out to bid and hoping the bidders do a good job when you choose one, we chose someone to help us design it, and then they build it. And it's a chosen contractor and not a, a bidding process like traditional and we found a company that had uh, quite a few successes before that they were we had a lot of confidence in and and this project is just going along swimmingly and you probably shouldn't say that about a sewer plant but um but it is moving along and uh it again that building was old it they had little enunciator lights like in the 80s movies war games you know and really needed to upgrade all of the monitoring and all the electric systems to uh, to make to bring it up out of the 80s and get it in so that it'll be ready for the next 20 years because I don't think we're going to stay stagnant. We're going to keep growing. And so we, we got to have uh, the infrastructure to support that. Um, and, of course, there was a lot of years of def deferred maintenance in that plant, and some things were nearing failure. So we were we were getting close to critical. And that's one of those ones, again, that's connected to our river. We do not want to be the ones making things worse in the river. And so uh, I think it's very responsible that we've taken on that um, project. So uh, I talked a little bit about stormwater utility. That, because we got the freshwater, the wastewater, and now we're going to have stormwater as well. And we're getting really close to implementing that. Um, and we also have a, a new agreement with the irrigation district that is part of that uh, stormwater that uh, we use their canals when they're not pumping water through it in the wintertime for our stormwater. And so we got a new agreement with them that'll help us be better partners in the future. Um, over at the water treatment plant, we have an 80-year-old building that has been patched and added on to and uh, has really worked, but is not ready for an earthquake and it, there it's just not uh the way things are done these days and so try choosing a new water plant can't really build it on the same location because you're kind of using that one so you got to find a location that works and then there's new technologies you got to explore and there's sizing of the plant are we going to grow are people going to use more water or less water or you know, what's the, so there's a lot of decisions to be made along that road, but staff has done a great job of making it understandable for the council. Um, we had to pull on the reins a couple times and say, well, we're not caught up yet. And so we're, we're still stepping in that direction to 
replace that plant. And we, we almost had an idea of where it might go nearby that plant. And then some outside consultant we had said, hey, why, why don't you guys think about putting it out in the Spalding Industrial Park where you have industrial things instead of right in the center of town? And we're all, hmm, never thought of that. And they need water <laughs> out there. So now we're looking at possibly moving it to a, a location we maybe wouldn't have thought of. Uh, on our own that might work out better in the long run because a project like that, you know, that's, that's going to last 50, 80 years. And we want to make sure we make the right choices as we head in that direction. Um, let's see that, well, it says 86 years old here. I knew it was over 80. But that's a project that could be easily over $50 million. And you start thinking about numbers like that. It's like, wow, how do you not raise rates like in triplicate? Um, but there's ways you can go out for a bond, and we, they saved over $10 million in that department towards this replacement. And so I love telling stories about stuff like that, like you guys thought ahead. Um, and so that is really the single largest project that our city has ever undertaken was this uh, uh, water plant. Um, the park infrastructure needs. We have been working on our parks and you've noticed some new trails there's some new pathways to schools um that were finished so the I, I don't know if you've ever seen it but the buses for north middle school park over on morgan lane and the kids have to walk along the track and along the path and all the way to the buses because of course a lot of kids don't exercise <laughs> uh they get hooked to a video game or uh, are chatting with some device um, and so now at least get them to walk some distance that's safe. We don't want them having to walk across town, but, uh, check it out sometime. There's, and parents are doing it too. They're dropping them off even at Gilbert Creek and they have a teacher down there watching and they walk across and go that way. So that all the cars aren't cramming that parking lot. Uh, just simple things like that, where we're not trying to save the world, but we're changing it just a little at a time. Um, we made a lot of, uh, those trail extensions even in um, Portola Park or Eckstein Park, uh, Fruitdale Creek Trail extension, Greenwood Dog Park Trail, which I use in my neighborhood, um, and some more trail and, and sidewalk in Reinhardt Park. But also you probably saw the pickleball courts uh, go in at uh, Fruitdale Park, and we restriped some of the tennis courts, or some volunteers restriped it, um, at West Home Park, Laundridge Park, and Redwood Park. So that Now, I haven't played this game yet, but uh, I heard that you don't have to be an amazing athlete to play, so I might try it. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to host like pickleball tournaments and bring people to town and, and raise the awareness of that. It's just kind of fun to say pickleball. Um, but a recent audit indicated the city does not provide enough recreational facilities for senior population. And so we're trying to uh, make more of the trails that are easily accessible um, and then a wider range of, of users could utilize that. And one of the opportunities we have is up at Hillcrest Park. Um, the city bought this property years ago at the top of Hillcrest and Beacon by the freeway there. And that community, that northeast community, really doesn't have a park unless you count Lincoln School when the kids aren't there. Um, and so we want to develop that uh, not into a massive shiny park, but into some walking trails, a dog park, and, and improve it so people could have a place to park and, and get into that area so uh, they don't have to cross town to go find a park. Um, let's see. Also, oh, the soccer complex. There was a committee form that we tried for three, four years to come up with a location where we could have a soccer complex. You know Grants Pass loves soccer, and they're so underfielded uh, that... Every tournament they go to is somewhere else. It's Medford, it's Bend, it's Portland, it's Eugene. We don't have the facilities to host a tournament here or for the kids to play all year round. Uh, you can at the schools because there's a couple artificial turf fields there, but there was no place for the clubs to go um, and for the kids to, because now soccer is all year round. And uh, we tried to put in a, um, a sports complex with a few fields out at Allen Creek. Um, but ran into some obstacles there. We were going to use part of the school property of Allendale. And uh, first the school board was on board, said, yeah, let's do it. And then like six months later, they were like, uh, no, we don't want to do anything with that. We might have to build a school there 
to replace the one someday. So we don't want a bunch of artificial turf. And we're like, oh. so there goes 18 months of hoping and drawing. Um, so we tried to come up with other locations with the school, maybe North Middle School and Gilbert Creek Park and Highland, all those. And we almost had something worked out there, but felt like we didn't have full control as a city that we were going to give up a lot of control to the school district. And so we finally settled on with a little uh, push from Dutch Bros because they want to make some fields in, inside the racetrack at the fairgrounds. We said, well, let's put one in at the all sports park and people could walk across or bike across and, or drive around. And at least you'd have some near each other. And if they put two fields at the fairgrounds, we have one. There's two at the high school. That would make enough for a tournament in our town. And we could have a, a boutique tournament with maybe small sided games. Wouldn't have to be, you know, 2,000 people coming to our town, but we could have uh, enough teams of the smaller kind and make that work. So uh, if you hadn't had a chance to go walk on that field or check it out, it's pretty cool. It's not, um, not like the high school one where they're going to run you off. That's public property over there. So we like having control of that uh, so that all citizens can enjoy it and not just for soccer because you can restripe that thing to do a lot of things. Um, and put a, different teams going sideways or, or whatever there. But when they did that park, it was supposed to be the all-sports park. And for years, before I got into politics and learned that you can't say what you're thinking, I called it the uh, all-baseball park because they had 27 fields or however many, and we had one soccer field that had holes and ruts in it and everything. I was like, hmm, doesn't look like all-sports to me. Um, so it's nice to see that improve and be now it'll be used all year round and it's got a hand up. I don't think I'm taking questions yet, but uh, <laughs> interesting choice. Um, anyway, we we think that's the start of something um, as far as getting the soccer community um, back to a level where they want to be. And now, of course, we've got this infusion with Dutch Bros and their new soccer club and so we're hoping to capture some of that energy. They're even talking about bringing a semi-pro team to the fairgrounds and put in some locker rooms and, you know, really bring it up a notch. And so wouldn't that be something? Um, and all of these things were accomplished while our county as a whole struggled to find adequate funding. When our region was invaded by gangrene or green rush, whatever you want to call it, and with turnovers in, in staff and council. And at the start of each new year, we as a council with the staff set our priorities for the next fiscal year. And this year, our top nine priorities, I think, turned out really good. The first one was build a new water treatment plant. That's pretty basic. We need to have clean water. Um, encourage an adequate supply of affordable housing opportunities was our second one, and we're, we're working on that one um, already, even though it's not July yet when we usually start these goals. Um, reduce homelessness and vagrancy in the downtown area. And I really like keeping those two separate. Homelessness is a problem you can attack and help people with, but vagrancy is another one. And that's what I think some of the help agencies have trouble keeping that line separate. You don't want to enable anyone to live under the radar and not be a productive member of society. But, yeah, homelessness is something we, we want to fight a, at a different conversation because vagrancy is something that keeps people from going to the park and it keeps tourists from coming to our town. And it keeps businesses from being as successful as they can downtown. And it also would keep them from having to clean stuff off of their back porches and front porches on those businesses. So um, uh, we're trying to work both those things separately. Um, an enhancement of Riverside Park. You've probably heard about the pavilion and the active club grant that we got from the lottery for uh, $500,000. So there's going to be a pavilion there. And we finally decided on the design. And so it's close maybe ready for not this year's Boatnik, but for next year's Boatnik. And then so many more events besides just that. Um, but also the, we move forward on a spray park idea there at the east end of the playground near where the old soccer field was and saw some designs for that. Then that's moving forward. That's going to be a great place for families. And when you bring in that good activity, that pushes out some of that bad activity. So... Um, also working on replacing the Isaac Walton building. Some of you that have been around a while remember the Isaac Walton building. People used to get married there. Groups would meet. Uh, it finally met the end of its life, but we're going to make a nice place there for uh, concerts in the park, for any kind of event, weddings, uh, 4th of July. Um, it's really going to be a neat, a neat park, and it already is, but we're going to enhance it some more. 
Um, develop a parking management plan. That's uh, number five. Downtown parking is not that bad, but Dutch Bros is going to make it bad. Um, <laughs> when they come in and build their gorgeous redevelopment of that building that isn't that pretty, um, that's going to be a great shot in the arm for downtown, but yeah, then you've got to park all these people. And so we're going to work on ideas for that. We may end up with a parking structure, even though the one in Medford is in a weird spot and kind of an eyesore. Um, we want to build something that fits in the community. Maybe it has businesses on the ground level or something. Um, we don't know. But we, we want to make sure the people that come to town have a place to park. Um, improve hiking and biking access to Dollar Mountain. That's the one up B Street uh, and Starlight up in there. A lot of people use it already, but access is pretty limited. Some through private property that they say, ah, go ahead, no place to really park. And, and so we want to um, increase that because more people are getting out and, and going hiking and biking. Um, we also want to develop landscape amendments focusing on zero-scape planter strips and reducing landscape strips. Um, nothing like getting out of your car and stepping into a mud puddle with grass and leaves in it. Um, but all sidewalks along the side kind of look bad too. So you, I think we've, we want to reach a balance there to where it's not all planter strips and it's not all sidewalk and determine who's going to maintain them. And if the city's going to maintain all the ones that are on the major streets, then let's do it, you know, and not wait for the property owner. Let's make that decision. And so uh, even if it was just to redo it once and say, okay, now it's yours to take care of, we got it pretty again. Could you keep it that way? We're, we're not sure how it's going to work out, but we want to uh, make sure that the, our best foot forward is, uh, is there for everyone to see. Um, number eight, perform a comprehensive citywide payment condition assessment to assist in prioritization of future street... Boy, is that a government line or what? Of street reconstruction projects. Um, we had worked for a lot of years on just, there's a pothole, okay, let's go patch it. There's a street we're doing a water line in, and let's redo the sewer and repave it. You know, and, but over the last, it seems like 10 years or so, they've really got into more prioritizing and more thoughtful approach. And this pavement condition assessment will really help them prioritize because I don't know how many miles of streets we have, but it's way more than you first think. Um, do you remember that number, Jason? Yeah, it's a lot. There's a lot of streets. And some are at different levels of repair, and some have never been touched in, you know, 60 years. And so um, uh, we, we just want to have that information so we can make it a uh, better place to drive and walk around in and bike in and use your little scooters and stuff. Um, you know, two-wheel scooters, not the battery ones. Um, the ninth one is develop Hillcrest Park, which I kind of spoke of earlier. So we got a, a good group of goals for next year. And we'll approach these goals with the same tenacity and zeal that the city council and all the city employees have been doing for years. Never postponing hard choices, hard choices for someone else to deal with, and serving the citizens of this great community with honesty and integrity. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Please stay a while afterwards and enjoy a conversation with one of our elected officials, one of our staff members, or just another community member. Thanks again for coming.